to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Tales from the Hood, released in 1995. Tales is an anthology film, meaning it's a collection of different short stories rather than a single feature-length narrative. The only other anthology film I've covered on the Kill Count is Trick or Treat, way back in 2017. But while that movie featured intertwining stories that all took place in the same location, Tales from the Hood introduces its shorts individually using an overarching frame narrative. It's the old EC comic style framing device that's conventionally used in anthology films, including in the best known example from the horror genre, Creepshow. Tales from the Hood was co-written and directed by Rusty Cundiff, a filmmaker who would go on to direct 25 episodes of Chappelle Show. It was Cundiff's idea, pitched to his co-writer Darren Scott, to make a horror movie that also had a message to it. And when Rusty first said we should make these about social issues, I was like, what? Entertainment, it's a horror thing. And then the more I thought of it, I realized he was right, and that's what's made the project special all these years. Tales uses the horror genre to explore issues facing black people in America. And while the film isn't super gory and doesn't have any sexual assault, it does depict uncomfortable subject matter like police brutality, gang shootings, and domestic violence. So heads up on all that. The great thing about Tales though is that it's able to explore these heavy topics with a tone that keeps the movie fun. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the zany performance by Clarence Williams III, who I been quoting for two decades thanks to his role in Half Baked as Samson Simpson. I'm Cuban B. Yes, Cuban B. As funeral home director Mr. Sims, Williams guides us through a bunch of earnest stories, skillfully directed by Cundiff, that never get too preachy or heavy-handed. Because despite its messaging, Tales from the Hood remains a horror movie first and foremost, with some legitimately scary moments and memorably hilarious lines. With five different stories going on, it's also gonna have a bunch of kills for me to count. So let's get to work. The movie begins with a gun-wielding skeleton, and he is smoking. A trio of gang members named Bulldog Ball and Stack approach a funeral home in South Central LA, their pickup spot for a bunch of drugs they're acquiring. Now, the sooner we get the shit, the sooner we raise up out this motherfucker, man. Well, get in there then, and quit standing around talking about refried beans. Why the fuck you gonna refry some beans, man? Why not just fry that shit right the first time? And get up. The parlor is owned by a guy named Sims, who really knows how to make a headbanging entrance. I've been waiting for you, boys. The drugs these dudes are picking up were found by Sims in an alley, and he just wants to get rid of them. He's not exactly familiar with the narcotics business, nor its terminology. Now, where's the shit? The shit? The shit. The shit. <laughs> God damn, I love when Clarence Williams says the shit, even when he's got cigar flakes on his teeth. Don't worry. You'll get the shit. Happens to the best of us, man. I know from experience. Business! Before Sims grabs that dookie for him, though, how about they check out this dead body? Ball asks what happened to the dead young man named Clarence, and his question kicks off our short story format. In Rogue Cop Revelation, we see that Clarence was a young rookie police officer who one day responded to a call in a quiet neighborhood with his partner Newton. They find that two other officers have pulled over a guy for, uh, uh let's see here. Oh, yeah, broken taillight. Gotta get those fixed, you know? The man being harassed is Martin Morehouse, a city council member who's been taking down corrupt cops for selling drugs. That doesn't win him many fans in the force, though their harassment's not enough to deactivate this activist. I've got nothing against good cops. You what? I said I've got nothing against good cops, but I will see lowlife scum like you run out of the department. A fight breaks out, and like I said, content warning. Because it's tough to watch as Morehouse is beaten by officers Billy and Strom, who's played by Wings Hauser, and whose name evokes Strom Thurmond, the long-serving racist Dixiecrat senator from South Carolina. Clarence's partner Newton is no gentleman either, and also participates in the brutality, all while Billy Holiday's haunting Strange Fruit plays on the soundtrack. Clarence Clarence stops the beating, but is escorted away by Newton, who tells him he has no right interfering in matters like this. Those assholes are cops. Who the fuck are you to judge them? 
Though they promised Clarence that they would take Morehouse to a hospital, officers Billy and Strom instead drive him to the dock, where they put him in his front seat and stick him full of heroin, because they want to ruin his reputation as well as end his life. A little cocaine here, a little gravity there, and Martin Morehouse is killed in a murder set up to look like a drug-induced accident. A year later, an out-of-work Clarence is nursing his guilt with alcohol, but that doesn't stop him from having hallucinations of the martyred Martin Morehouse. Clarence, bring them to me. Clarence agrees to do just that, so he summons his three former co-workers to the cemetery on the anniversary of Morehouse's death. I like how Cundiff and Scott wrote the three evil cops here, giving them individual shades of malice, from ringleader to weak-willed follower to someone who fraternally defends heinous actions. On the force, the personalities that exist are everything from cowards to heroes to idiots. It's just... Everything that exists in the normal world exists on a police force. Clarence brings them to Morehouse's grave, which Strom promptly defiles by pissing all over it. Man, that's not cool. Way to go, Strom. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, never mind. Officer Billy thinks it's cool. Hilarious line delivery there by Dwayne Whitaker, who's probably best known as Maynard, the pawn shop guy in Pulp Fiction, but who's also been in some Rob Zombie movies. He was the guy in Halloween 2 who got stabbed in a field, and an occult specialist in Devil's Rejects and Three from Hell. Strom orders Billy to join him in urination, and since these guys are the kind to follow orders, the mustachioed officer steps up to comply. Right as Strom and Newton go to execute Clarence, Billy's grabbed by a zombie ham that beats his head against the tombstone and pulls him underground. The grave then erupts open, and Billy is shown to be dead. He's got a big ol' hole in his chest because his heart was ripped out by a zombie Martin Morehouse. And boy, is that zombie mad. Production shot this scene in an actual graveyard, which is wild when you consider that special effects supervisor Kenneth Hall had to dig a fake grave there and fire off an underground air cannon for these effects. Bullets don't phase the undead man, so the other officers flee, and after Morehouse pulls a Night of the Living Dead cemetery zombie on them, they drive away out of the graveyard. Only problem for the cops is, they can't seem to shake this guy. How far back? Ah! Not far back at all, dude! After a few more Jason Takes Manhattan-style teleportations, Morehouse gets the cops to crash, which allows him to murder Officer Strom by pulling him through the car roof and decapitating him. I could use a few more blood spurts on that headless body, but at least we get a good fake head made by K&B effects that Morehouse holds out like a predator. Newton takes aim with a faulty-looking fake gun and fires some shots that blow up his service vehicle along with zombie Morehouse. Seems to do the trick at first, but apparently not even this kick-ass fire can put the Zed down, because he appears behind Newton in an alley and lifts him up until he's air planking. Newton rips off some of Morehouse's chest, exposing a little chem lab inside his torso. Cool. And then the zombie council member uses some supernatural forces to send a bevy of hypodermic needles into Newton's body. They pin him against the wall where the mural to Morehouse is, and after one final needle is sent straight to the back of his mouth, <laughs> Newton is killed in a spectacular way, kind of melting against the wall and then being turned into graffiti meant to warn people to treat each other better. Welcome to my world. Bitch. Zombie Morehouse isn't quite done. He's still mad at Clarence for not preventing his death in the first place, so he attacks him in a way that leaves him locked up in a psych ward and blamed for the other cops' deaths. Might seem harsh, but Cundiff says it's to show how people's actions and inactions have consequences. It kind of goes to, when do you decide to do what's right? Sometimes coming up around to the right side is just too late. With that story done, we're back to the funeral home. And although the three gangsters would like to get the shit and leave, Mr. Sims just keeps going on and on about dead bodies. Find an interest outside of work, guy. I suggest drumming. Sims's next story is Boys Do Get Bruised. Young Walter Johnson, played by Baby Michael Jordan from Space Jam, has got a problem. A monster problem. And I don't mean the Monstars. Stars. <laughs> 
this monster is much scarier. Get a load of its creepy claws. Adding to his issues, Walter just started attending a new school, where a douche kid named Tyrone fights him at launch. But the black eye he's got didn't come from his peers. The bruise is noticed by a school nurse played by Takia Crystal Kima, known for in living color. She brings it to the attention of Walter's teacher, Richard Garvey, another symbolically named character played by director of the film, Rusty Cundiff. Cundiff began his career as an actor in films like School Days, written and directed by Spike Lee, who serves as an executive producer on Tales from the Hood, which basically means he helped get it made through funding and influence. Walter tells Mr. Garvey that his injury came from the monster at home. He came after my dad died. The boy draws pictures of the monster, which he says will act as a voodoo weapon. If he destroys the picture, it'll destroy the monster. I'm gonna burn him up. He's also drawn a picture of Tyrone. And you know what? Looks like that Crayola magic works. Cause all of a sudden, Tyrone's on his way to the hospital, with both his arms and legs broken. Boy must have had weak bones. Yes, weak bones. Guess he couldn't draw on their strength anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Garvey visits Walter's home that night and meets the legs of Walter's mom, Sissy, played by Paula J. Parker, who I know from Friday and as Trudy frickin' proud. She tells Garvey that Walter's bruises are just a product of his clumsiness, then comes on to the teacher because she loves a man in a nice big 90s suit. When Garvey mentions the monster, Sissy gets pissy. She yells at Walter for all his monster talk until they're stopped by the sound of the monster getting home. I love how this scene is shot from Walter's perspective. It really puts you in his shoes as he watches his mom's boyfriend Carl get home and asks Garvey what he's doing there. Carl is played by Detroit's own David Allen Greer, who got his BA from U of M, Go Blue, and his masters from Yale. After a stage career that earned him a Tony nomination, he turned to screen work and was cast in, hey look at that, in living color. Thus, he was largely known as a comedic actor when he was cast as this monster of a character, who's already fixing to hit Walter some more. I will talk to him. Yeah, something tells me the only language Carl knows is violence. Carl makes Sissy show Garvey to the door, and after Walter watches his hope for salvation prepare to leave, the monster comes back into his room, angry about having its likeness drawn. You like to draw fucked up pictures of people, huh? Domestic abuse alert, because Carl gets physical with both Walter and Sissy, whom he beats with his hand and a belt. The abuse is overheard by Garvey, who races back to the house and is led in by Sissy. Carl turns his attention from Walter to the teacher, and another long fight ensues, occasionally producing bubble yum blood. It doesn't end until Walter, hoping to stop Carl from using a frying pan against his mom, breaks his arm with the drawing. He then breaks the bastard's body all over, with a series of creases, and one mighty final crumple. I love the effects for this sequence, done by Screaming Mad George, which makes a lot of sense if you remember his rubbery surreal nightmares from movies like Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, and of course, Society. The voodoo attack leaves Carl looking like a little monster who got exposed to light. This shit ain't over yet! It really is though, dude. A stomp from Sissy silences Carl, and to cover up this peculiar cause of death, Walter lights the paper on fire, leaving Carl's corpse nothing more than a burnt bastard skelly. Yes, sir. Walter. Kill the monster. You know, I've heard of drug dealers keeping their buyers around by talking too long, but this is just getting ridiculous, Sims. <sighs> Fuck it though. Guess they'd better just sit back and hear about where this doll came from. Hit us with a crazy hair. KKK comeuppance begins at the plantation home of a southern senator. He's running for governor now, but also he's an ex-clan member. So some people are not fans of his Jesse Helm style pro dog whistling campaign. They were as relentless about finding a job as they are hounding me. Am I putting an end to welfare? Duke Metker, whose name evokes David Duke, is played by Corbin Burnson, aka Dr. Alan Finestone, aka Dr. Larry Kane. I didn't even recognize him with all that hair. The protests are fueled by Duke's recent purchase of this building, called the Dollhouse by an angry man named Eli, whose actor Art Evans was also in Christine, where he played the first guy killed by the evil car. The so-called Dollhouse has a bloody history to it. After the Civil War, the Confederate owner of the house decided to massacre his newly emancipated slaves rather than let them go free. 
12 bodies hanging from that tree alone. Strange fruit indeed. According to local legend, the souls of the slain slaves remained at unrest until a voodoo woman named Cobbs bought the place and put them into dolls. Where it is, they remain in the house right to this day. And although he hasn't seen them yet, they really are there. Duke doesn't mind the risk though, and is happy to turn this place of slaughter into a campaign headquarters. I think the whole thing adds to a certain southern charm. Corbin Bernson is great at playing this despicable character, who ends up saying a lot of really offensive things. I think as we rolled, I apologized to everybody before each take. Nice sentiment, but it sounds like it wasn't necessary. I looked at Darren and Rusty, and they were cracking up behind the camera. They were loving it. Working for Duke is an image consultant named Rhodey, played by Roger Guinevere Smith, who was in a bunch of Spike Lee movies before this. Rhodey's ready to help take the racist edge off of Duke's rhetoric, no matter how distasteful Ms. Cobbs might have found his job. He practices interview questions with Duke, and even cracks a racist joke while role playing as his boss. Well, the only spooks that I'm afraid of are the ones with guns. <laughs> That's a good one, Rody. I like that. I believe I'm going to use it. Uh, no, not if you <laughs> want to get elected, you won't. During the drill, though, Rody trips backwards down the stairs and dies when he cracks his head open against the wall. Duke attends the funeral, where a sermon is given by a priest, played by the director's dad, John A. Cundiff, and tells the reporters that Rody's death was just an accident. It wasn't caused by haunted house problems. So you're not afraid of the ghosts? Well, the only spooks I'm afraid of... Are you spooky reporters? <laughs> Good fucking save, dude. Good fucking save. The very out of place looking Eli tells Duke that if he doesn't leave the dollhouse, he's gonna have more problems. But Duke ignores the man and drives off in his limo. Oh, sweet, free doll! Oh, I forgot. No doll time in the limo. Damn. Turns out that doll is actually responsible for Rhodey's death. Duke notices the little guy in a primo tripping position when he looks over that tape. Wow, zoomy! Duke realizes that the doll is missing from the Ms. Cobbs painting, which means the slave's soul has flown the frame and is able to run around in a panting POV shot like this is Puppet Master or some shit. <laughs> Duke finds the doll sitting on his staircase with a sinister smile. He screams at the doll that he's not responsible for slavery and yells no reparations while throwing a vase. But I think the guy needs to get a hold of himself, throwing vases at dolls that ain't even there. He starts to Hulk smash and attacks the painting with a flag, which causes it to bleed rag pigment all over the place. The plantation doll returns with some wonderful stop motion, then leaps onto and chomps at Duke until the senator overpowers his weak little doll body. Duke dispenses of the doll with a shotgun, but he may be in more trouble than he thinks, because that painting all of a sudden looks like a half-used sheet of stickers. Duke finds that he's failed to stop the pissed-off doll, which was created by Charles and Edward Kyoto, aka the Kyoto Brothers, the wonderful dudes who brought us killer clowns from outer space. They created three or four versions of the doll, in various moods and physical conditions, and for many shots used simple rod puppetry to move the limbs and head. For other shots, though, they had to use stop motion, a technique I always love to see in movies. There's something organic about the stop motion that I think makes it cool. At this point, the painting has been entirely emptied of its puppets. They're all here in Duke's office and ready to rumble. And they don't want your brandy, dude, so don't even bother there. He drapes himself in the flag, but since this isn't an election, he's not about to win that way. Duke was originally going to die by being hanged with an American flag from the tree outside his office. But the studio said, nah, People want to see the dolls take them out. And we said, yeah, give us the money to do that. So the Kyotos and Bernson got some extra days of work, and Duke dies at the hand of a swarm of puppets who tear him apart with their teeth. His death is so poetically just that Ms. Cobb shows up for a front row seat to the spectacle, played by the director's mom, Christina Cundiff. I bet she's real proud of her son right now. At the funeral home, the trio of gangsters is getting real sick of stories and just wants the shit. Ah, oh, the shit. After one final body, boys, the most relevant one of all. You knew him? Show no. Did. We didn't know him. He was just a nigga we seen around. 
Hardcore Convert is the story of gang violence that follows Crazy K, a violent dude with sprayed on sideburns played by Lamont Bentley, who was Hakim in Moesha, but who sadly died in a car accident in 2005 at the age of 31. Crazy K drives up to Lil Deke, a guy he's got beef with, and kills him in the street by shooting him a whole bunch. Damn, K, you really gonna rob us of some Ricky Harris screen time like that? Some epic music by composer Christopher Young begins. <laughs> as Deke's associates come out of a house and shoot Crazy K to the ground. As he lays dying in the street, they taunt him with modulated voices. Shut now, Crazy K. Are you crazy, huh? Oh, I'm kind of fucked up. While they were talking shit, some apparently silent police rolled up and posted up behind them. The cops open fire and shoot the other gang members to the ground, preventing them from putting the kibosh on Crazy K. Say by the motherfucking cop. Yeah. After four years behind bars, two of them on the solitary confinement fitness plan, Jerome, aka Crazy K, is selected for a behavioral modification trial by Dr. Cushing, played by Rosalind Cash of Omega Man fame, in one of her final roles before cancer took her life at 56. Jerome is driven to a spooky house on a hill, where he's escorted through stone tunnels populated by backup dancers for Devo. He's placed inside a cramped cell next to a dude so racist he's devoted an entire pack to some Hitler ink. The guy talks of a biblical race war, and though his rhetoric is upsetting, the guy points out that Jerome's already been doing his work for him. Those guys you killed, what color were they? That's the thing with Tails. Rusty Cundiff and Darren Scott chose to not only bring light to external problems facing their community, but to also criticize black people who put each other down, like how Rhodey was helping a racist politician get elected. We harbor some umbrage towards those who hurt their own. Cushing tells her subject that if he adapts well to her program, he'll be released from prison. If not, he'll die behind bars. And she don't care either way. Because I think he's scum, Jerome. So don't test me, you understand? He's stripped down to his skivvies and put in chains, very much resembling a victim of the slave trade, then strapped down to a Frankensteinian slab where his head is shaved ahead of this clockwork oranging. Or actually, maybe he's getting tested for COVID. Oh, never mind. I don't think that's part of any COVID test. At least I hope not. A metal viewfinder is placed over his eyes, and with some beep bops and bim bams, Dr. Cushing begins her program. Fair warning, this is a super intense scene with lots of racially sensitive imagery depicting historical violence. As a song called Born to Die by Spice One blares, Jerome is subjected to flashes of gang violence intercut with photos of Klan rallies and lynchings. It's intentionally uncomfortable and lasts an excruciating two and a half minutes, becoming downright nauseating near the end, which is exactly what Cundiff and Scott wanted. Well, but the more important thing to us uh, about that story was just commenting on black on black violence and about the fact that, you know, it's been three or four hundred years with being oppressed and being attacked, it's a good time to stop oppressing and attacking each other. Also, I'm not counting any kills in this montage. Half of them are historical, and for the other half, well, I'm not about to go frame by frame through this sequence. I've got my limits, okay? Again, though, the discomfort is the point. Cushing yells as much to Jerome. What's wrong, Jerome? You don't like seeing black people get killed? But isn't that what you've been doing all your life? It's some heavy shit, to say the least, but it was important to Rusty Cundiff to include. He called it an effective teaching moment. Gang members come up to me and say that they rethought what they were doing because of the Crazy K episode. Cushing then lowers Jerome into a sensory deprivation chamber where he'll be forced to confront his ego and subconsciousness. Different kind of warning this time because we've got a lot of hardcore flashing lights going on for a while. Look away if you need to, y'all. In between the strobing, Jerome sees individuals from his past who are dead because of him. How come we ain't talked in a long time? That's right. You killed my ass. I'm not gonna count these ghosts slash hallucinations though, since we never met them and we didn't see their actual deaths. Crazy K defends himself against the moral appraisement of his actions, even when the ghost of a little girl says that she was an innocent victim killed in one of his drive-bys. Oh, a, a bullet ain't got no name on it. You, you, 
He was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Dr. Cushing appears and asks Jerome if he's ready to apologize for what he's done, but it sounds like Crazy K is completely irredeemable. I got one motherfucker responsibility in this world. That's me, and that's it, motherfucker! He attempts to threaten his way out of this situation, but his obstinance is all for naught, because he's not actually in a sensory deprivation chamber. He's still on the street, coughing up blood from his bullet wounds. His shooters are still standing over him, and they open fire to end K's near-death experience and final chance at redemption. And that's how Crazy K wound up in the funeral home. Actually, that's not the whole story behind Crazy K's death. Turns out the three dudes who killed him were in fact Bulldog Ball and Stack. And they are tired of dead body story time. So let's go and get the shit. Oh yeah, the doo doo. <laughs> Sick of fun. Yeah. The booby de pop. We gonna get the shit. Sims takes them downstairs, turns on his lights with a finger, and says that the shit is in these three coffins. Where's what I hide? Uh, I don't know, guy, a safe? The gangsters go to get the shit, only to find that the coffins hold their bodies instead. Mr. Sims explains that all three of them are dead. They were shot down by Crazy K's accomplices after they killed him. The music swells and gets downright scary as Clarence Williams' unhinged performance pays off with the reveal of what's been happening this whole time. This ain't no funeral home. The Terradome, neither. Welcome to hell. Aw, oh, he got a snaky time. The boys piss themselves and watch as Sims become Satan right before their eyes, using more prosthetic work made by Screaming Mad George. Devil Sims was meant to look cancerous, which I think works great, even if the four-hour makeup process was a pain in the ass for Clarence Williams. I asked Clarence at the end of it, he said, uh, Clarence, how did you like that? He goes, I did not. Totally worth it for this Mr. Toad ending. It is absolutely bonkers and legitimately unsettling. How many people died in all these tales that we were told? Let's find out and get to the shit. Yes, the doo doo, the poopity pop. Yeah, we're gonna get to the shit. 13 people died in Tales from the Hood, not counting deaths in that disturbing montage or those ghosts in that strobe light scene. Oh, and everyone killed was a guy. With a runtime of 98 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 7.54 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Officer Newton. Getting killed by dirty needles might win the award on its own, but the effects as he gets turned into a mural are a lot of fun to watch. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Clarence, since we don't even know how he died. Uh, guilt? And that's it. Tales from the Hood came out in 1995 and unfortunately was marketed as a silly spoof, so it didn't get the recognition it deserves. I'll look at the disappointing sequel on Sunday, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Trevor Batson, Brian Liberum, Majin Moonman, Ian Eldridge, Daniel Grimwood92, Christian Exum, and Philip Wynn. Oh, and also Logan Arnold and his cool mom, Melissa. It's October, which means a buttload of kill counts are coming your way. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.